That was great. You guys sounded great. Thank you for coming again. And uh, we are going to continue on in the Gospel of John. But before we do that, I want to point out the last song we sang, Blessed Assurance. I don't know if you remember who wrote this song. It's Fanny Crosby, right? And, uh, and the, you may not know this. I think most of you do. But he was, she was blind. And a lot of her songs have visions and watching and looking and seeing the Lord, even though she was blind. Uh, this song was no, no different. Visions of rapture now ver burst on my sight. Watching and waiting, looking above. So she knew, you know, someday she was going to see Jesus. Amen. You know, that's great. Yeah, even though she was blind all of her life. I, I, well, not, I don't think she was blind from birth. I think she became blind when she was like three or four years old. But then she was blind the rest of her life. And uh, yet she still... Love the Lord and looked for Him in His coming. Amen? So that's a great thing. Well, another person was looking for Jesus, and He was sent to be a voice in the wilderness, and that's who we're talking about here in the Gospel of John. And uh, we're going to continue on. We've been going through uh, John 1, and we're not going to get through it again today. We have one more week in it after this week. Uh, I know there's a, there's a lot of verses in John, so we're, we're going to go through it this morning. But uh, let's go ahead and open in prayer. Father, we thank you this morning for your goodness, your graciousness, and your love, Lord. Thank you that we are able to meet outside, uh, worship you freely. Thank you for the freedom we have in this country, Lord. We would pray that we never take that for granted. And we just pray, Lord, that you help us to remember to share your goodness and your love with others that we come in contact with and be the church outside of our little church bubble. In Jesus' name, amen. Alrighty, well let's continue on with the Gospel of John. Uh, if you've got a Bible, we're picking it up in John 1, uh, verse 19. So I'm going to read a few verses, give you some uh, thoughts about it, and uh, we're going to go through John 1, 19 through 34 this morning. And let me just read you exactly what it says here from the Bible, from the New American Standard Bible. This is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent him to priests, oh, so, I'm sorry, when the Jews sent to him priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask, who are you? So here we go. Why is this committee sent from the Pharisees to investigate John the Baptist? Well, Mark tells us why. John doesn't tell us this, but Mark tells us in his gospel. Let me read you that directly. And in Mark 1, 4 and 5, it says, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea was coming out to him and all the people of Jerusalem. And they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Now, John, the gospel the writer of John, does not tell us why they were coming out to him. But Mark gives it away here. See, the Pharisees were jealous of anyone who stole their thunder, right? The Pharisees were the religious leaders of the day. Everyone was supposed to come to them to be able to speak to God. They were the authorities. But here this young upstart shows up, John, uh, on their turf, and he has the audacity to claim that God wants repentance from everyone. They didn't like that at all. I don't believe that they were, this, the committee, I don't, did not believe personally that the committee was interested in anything John had to say, except maybe to trap him by his testimony. I actually believe that they were secretly hoping John would proclaim that he was the Messiah and that they could trap him with his words, just like later on they tried to trip up and trap Jesus, right? And we will get to that later on as, as we go through the Gospel of John. But listen to what John says in John uh, 120 he says and he confessed and did not deny but confessed i am not the christ they asked him then are you elijah and he said i am not are you the prophet and he answered no then they said to him verse 22 who are you so that we may give an answer to those who sent us what do you have to say about yourself See, they couldn't just go back to the committee with a bunch of no's, right? With no, no, no response. See, even after John denied being the Christ, they still pressed him for a detailed answer. Now, I'm not sure that the folks who came to John and asked him these questions were that really concerned with him. I believe that it was the Pharisees. Oh, and we find out it was the Pharisees in the next couple of verses, right? Uh, that were sent to John. They were not going to be happy until they had something on which to convict John 
with their religious laws. Because again, John was stealing their thunder, right? The Pharisees were the ones that were in charge. They were the religious leaders. They were the experts of the law. They were the ones that the people were supposed to go to and find out what it means to have a relationship with God. And they could only have the relationship with God through the Pharisees. They missed it badly, didn't they, right? Well, again, look how they kept pressing John, right? I'm pretty sure the Pharisees told the committee, don't come back and report to us till you get the answer we're looking for. Anybody ever had an argument with somebody and, uh, you know, and, 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 you, and you give your reason for the argument and somebody says, well, no, but what about this? What about this? And, and they, they, they really just didn't want to hear what you had to say, right? They, they, they had their own mind made up and they were just hoping to convince you rather than you know, have a dialogue back and forth with each other. Well, I, I think that's what was going on here then. So they asked him more questions. I also think the committee may have been a bit confused. John, if you remember from Luke's gospel, is the son of Zacharias, a Levite. So John was a Levite and should have been serving in the temple. That's what the Levites did. But God had bigger things planned for John, amen? Okay, John's ministry was to prepare everyone for the grand entrance of his cousin, Jesus. He could not do that by just serving in the temple. He had to get out of the church building to tell people about God, about the baptism of repentance, and proclaim the way of the Lord. Listen to what he says here in, in uh, John 1, 23. He said, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the path of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet has said crying in the wilderness. How about us? Yes, I know we meet in a church setting every week. Sometimes we're in the building. Right now we're outside, and it's a really nice, cool breeze today, isn't it? It's beautiful today. God, God has really blessed us, right? Uh, but, you know, and yes, the buildings and the church and the staff of the church help the community by being a presence here. I don't doubt that at all. But think and act on what we could do differently outside of our little church bubble right? What can we do to call people to repentance and receive forgiveness through Jesus? Just be a good witness, right? Let, let people know your story, that you, you, you believe in Christ because it's true and because he's done some amazing things in your life. And that's not an experiential conversion. Everybody has an experience. Hindus, Buddhists, everybody has some kind of experience. But we have the truth, grounded in history in the Bible, right? The Bible says it's the New Testament. A testament is an eyewitness. These are actual events that happen, right? So what is God calling you to do to be a voice in his wilderness? And I don't mean the desert. There's plenty of spiritual desert in the city, amen? <laughs> right? The city is a wilderness, and people around are all lost in sin. The wilderness of sin. And I'm, I'm going to go off script here a little bit. There's one such example just down the street that just opened up. It's called Planned Parenthood. They opened a building just down the street from us, and uh, people are actually rejoicing that Planned Parenthood is now here to provide medical services. Unfortunately, one of the biggest money-maker services that they offer is abortion. Okay, you'll, you'll have people say, oh, well, just abortion is just a little part of what they do, but it's not true. It's a big part of what they do. It's, it's the main thing that they do. But I think what we need to do is instead of standing out there with picket signs and, and making people uncomfortable and, uh, and yelling at us, which is I've seen that happen, we need to pray for the scared young women who go to visit this facility looking for answers, right? Right? Uh, we need to pray that they're convinced and that they shouldn't terminate their pregnancies, and there is a better option for them. There's a lot of people that are looking to adopt. I know the women are scared, I get that, but abortion is not the answer. It's, it's, it's stealing the life of someone, right? Now, of course, there's other evils in the world, but we all need to be a John the Baptist and call out evil when we see it, regardless of what it will cost us. Look, John the Baptist was so convinced of God calling him out to call out sin and evil that it cost him his earthly life. When he called out Herod for marrying his brother's wife. Do you remember that? 
we'll get to that later on in the Gospel of John. I'm, I'm, well, actually, I'm not sure if John covers it, but I'll, I'm sure I'll get back to it, okay? There are, of course, other... Okay, uh, uh, but let's go back to the Scripture, though, right? All right. Uh, now, ver John 1, 24. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. So that's that council I was telling about. John the author reveals the source of all these questions that the committee was asking of John the Baptist. The same group of jealous religious rulers that convinced Judas to betray Jesus in a little bit while, right, for 30 pieces of silver. They were the jealous Pharisees. Remember, they were the big shots of their day. However, in the midst of these lost, proud leaders that Jesus also called out publicly, remember, he called them a den of vipers, just like John the Baptist does, right? There was at least one that questioned what they were doing and came to see Jesus alone at night. Remember who his name was? Nic Nicodemus, right? We're going to get to him in chapter 3. We're not there yet, but I promise we'll get back to Nicodemus later on. Let's go back to uh, John 1, 25 now. They asked him and said, Why then are you baptizing, if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? So they're basically saying, We don't get it. If you're not the Christ, or Elijah, re you know, come back, like it was predicted, and if you're not the prophet that's predicted in Deuteronomy... What are you doing? Why are you baptizing? What's the point? Well, John answered them. He says in John 26 here, 126, John answered them saying, I baptize in water, but among you stands one whom you do not know. It is he who comes after me, the thong of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. See, John isn't pulling any punches here, is he, right? Sure, he's been baptizing with water. He's been calling people to repentance. And that message has been successful. But something even greater than repentance is about to hit the scene. That someone is the person of Jesus Christ, amen? His cousin. John was a good Bible scholar in his own right, and he knew his Old Testament. And although he lived in the wilderness and eschewed the good life that many of the religious leaders enjoyed, Remember, the Pharisees, you know, they thought they were blessed by God, and that's why they were living high on the hog there, right, and, and bringing the people in uh, that they chose to let people know, right? They, they had to come to the Pharisees, though, to get forgiveness from God, right? Well, John was a Levite and a Nazarite, which meant that he didn't consume alcohol, right? He stayed away from dead bodies, and he was consecrated to the Lord. Do you remember that? Uh, in Luke, when the angel Gabriel appears to Zacharias and said he will be a Nazarite, he, he will not drink alcohol, doesn't, can't touch dead bodies, and he is consecrated to the Lord. Amen? Well, John knew that every good deed he did on his own in God's eyes was like a filthy rag. Isaiah 64, 6 says, For all of us, have become like one who is unclean, and all of our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. Amen? Right? And although John could not take away the sin of the world, he was called to confess who the Christ was, what his role would be, that is, Jesus' role, what his role would be, that is, John the Baptist's role, and prepare the folks with the baptism of repentance. Now, just dunking someone underwater doesn't automatically make them sorry for their sins, right? <laughs> That's not what it does, it right? The baptism that John did was a public display for anyone who wanted to confess that he had fallen woefully short of perfection and was genuinely sorry for the offenses that they committed against God. As David says in Psalm 51, Psalm 51 4, some of you may know this already, against you, you only, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. You see, John was using baptism as a public display that people needed to repent. And apparently, although he was calling out sin and inviting folks to share it publicly by confessing that they were sinners, the people still came to him. You would think calling out sin wouldn't be a very popular message, right? But the Bible tells us that all of Judea came to him, right? And all of Jerusalem. Right? The Holy Spirit was doing a mighty work in John the Baptist. Amen? Folks were coming to the Jordan and confessing their sins and wanting to get right with God without going through the Pharisees. And that's what they didn't like. 
And when you think about it, it wasn't a very popular thing, again, to be telling people that they were sinners. As a matter of fact, it's not popular today. All right? Our job, though, was we got to let people realize that they have sinned by their own admission. We don't judge them. That's up to God, right? Let's remember that. We're not judging people. God is the ultimate judge. Our job as Christians is to bring folks to the cross of Christ after they have realized that they need him. We don't judge people. Again, I'm going to repeat that. But we show them that by their own convictions, they have violated the law of God and need to get right with God. Amen? But no one will be ever be saved if they do not think they need the eternal grace of God and the gift of His Son, Jesus Christ, and the sacrifice that He made for us on the cross. It's been said, and it's a true statement here, that Jesus can only restore a heart if the heart is broken. If the heart is stony, that is, if someone doesn't believe that they need a Savior because they have hardened their heart to the ways of God and His laws, then they will treat God's grace cheaply. And God does not have cheap grace, right? What did, what did God's grace cost? The death of His Son, right? The most precious thing in the universe, right? Remember what happened when Jesus spoke to the rich young ruler? The Bible tells us he went away sad because he was wealthy. Well, he wasn't sad just because he was wealthy. He was sad because he refused to recognize how far from God he was, right? He was not humble. There was a God in his life with a little g that wasn't the God with a capital G, and that God was his wealth. Now, does this mean that all wealthy people cannot be saved? Of course not. Don't get that, get, don't get that thought at all. But if the wealth that someone has or their career, or their station in life, or anything else is taking the place of God, then they are in trouble. Right? They need to put God first. Jesus didn't go running after the rich young ruler and say, wait, wait, come back to me. No. Jesus, again, only revealed himself to those that were broken that knew they needed a Savior, right? He doesn't roll that way, right? The Bible clearly tells us in Revelation that he stands at the door and knocks. Revelation 3.20 Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and will dine with him and he with me. Jesus doesn't break down the door. He's not an intruder, right? He waits for you to open the door and invite him in. And you can only invite him in if you recognize how far away from the perfection of God that you are. And, and again, it doesn't matter who you are, where you were born, who your parents were. Uh, Franklin Graham had to come to the Lord Jesus Christ on his own. Not because Billy and Ruth were Christians. Okay, that, that's not what saved him. What, what saved Franklin Graham was his own admission that he needed Jesus. What saves everyone is their own admission that they need the Lord, right? The Bible tells us very clearly in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so people need to recognize that. Let's go back to John 1.28 now. These things took place in Bethany beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing. This little town of Bethany, not Bethlehem, but Bethany, will play an important role in the ministry of Jesus. So stay tuned for that, all right? I promise we will be back in Bethany with Christ several times before we finish this great gospel. But let's go back to John 1, 129 now. The next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he on behalf of whom I said after me, comes a man who is a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. I did not recognize him, but so that he might be manifested to Israel, I came baptizing in water. All right, now I'm going to take a little aside from my own notes here, and I'm going to quote J. Vernon McGee directly about these last three verses, because I think this is very powerful. John marks him out here. He is the Savior. He is not only the Messiah, he is also the Savior. He is a very great Savior, for He is the Lamb of God. He is the complete Savior, because He takes away sin. He is the Almighty Savior, because He takes away the sin of the world. He is the perpetual Savior, because He takes away, present tense, anyone can come to Him at any time. Amen? 
Here we find the fulfillment of the answer that Abraham had given to Isaac those many years ago. Isaac had said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide a lamb for the burnt offering himself. John tells us that Jesus is a lamb, the lamb of God. This proves that Cain was wrong and Abel was right. Abel brought a little lamb. All the lambs that were slain on Jewish altars down through the ages now find their fulfillment in him, Jesus Christ. And John marks him out. Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Amen? Back to uh, John 1, 32-34. John testified, saying, I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven and remained upon him. I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, He upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. Here we see the three parts of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right. Now we know from the other three Gospels, that Jesus did get baptized. We also know that John didn't want to baptize Jesus. Okay? When Jesus came to be baptized, John said, uh, you should be baptizing me. I shouldn't be baptizing you. But Jesus told John to baptize him to show his obedience to the Father as an example to us. All right? So John did. And as soon as Jesus was baptized, the Father's voice came from heaven, heaven approving what Jesus did. And the Holy Spirit descended on him in a physical body that took the shape of a dove. Man, that must have been a sight, right? The people that were there and saw that. I mean, you imagine the heavens breaking open, a voice coming from, not thunder, you know, not, but an actual voice that they could hear in their own language coming from heavens. Would that freak you out? No? Yes. Is it just me I'd be freaked out? Yeah, right? Well, that's what happened. John saw that, and he says in verse 34, I myself have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. So for the final verse of today, we have John's confession of the one of who Christ is. For he saw for himself what happened when he baptized Jesus. If he had any doubt, the Father confirmed that Jesus was who John thought he was when he sent his voice from heaven and the Holy Spirit alighted on him as a dove. So as we wrap up today's message, ask yourself these questions. Have you confessed to the world publicly who Jesus is? Have you repented of your sins? Have you received the free grace and forgiveness from God? If so, that's great. But you need to tell somebody that you've done that. Right? You need to be a witness for Christ. Be a John the Baptist. Let Christ increase in your life as you decrease in your life. Fully rely on Jesus, just as John did when he was under arrest in Herod's prison just before his beheading. You remember he sent some people out to Jesus to find out, are you really the one? Or should we wait for someone else? And what did Jesus say? He didn't say, yep, it's me. He said, proof. He sent proof back. He said, tell John that you know, the lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear. In other words, that's what the Messiah was to do. And yes, I am him. And so he basically fortified John's belief that he was the one. And even though John didn't have much longer for this earthly life, he was going to be with Christ forever in heaven. Amen? So if you haven't done this in your life, today is the day of salvation. Take care of that now. Don't wait. You don't know what tomorrow will hold, right? I don't know if anybody got a, a email from us or the link. Uh, I think it was the link on Facebook. I'll, I'll send the email out. But um, I put on our website, and you can see that in uh, past sermons there, uh, when I interviewed Mr. Kruver for the children at Sycamore Grove School back in 2010. Um, and I asked him, you know, what was it that had you come to the Lord? And he said, you know, he grew up in a Christian school. He was in third grade. But when he was about 16 years old, he saw a motorcycle accident, and the guy was basically saying, screaming, help me, help me, save me. And nobody would help him because, you know, they were afraid to touch him and move him because he was, he was really in really bad shape. And you don't, if you don't know what you're doing, you don't make it worse, right? But they did call for help. And uh, 
And then finally he said, you know, if no one will help me, then kill me. Put me out of my misery. And, and Bill said that the Holy Spirit talked to him that day and said, what if you were that man? Are you ready to meet Jesus? He said, wow, he got convicted big time. Next time he could, he made a confession of who Christ was, became a, became a born-again believer. Even though he grew up in a Christian school, he didn't really commit his life to the Lord until that time. You don't know what tomorrow holds for you, ladies and gentlemen. Whether you're in this audience or out in internet land, we just do not know. Get right with Jesus before you leave this earth, okay? All right. Accept Christ and his provision for your forgiveness. Accept the Lamb of God. Not all the lambs that were sacrificed, but the one lamb that was sacrificed on Calvary. Okay? Accept the sacrifice that was provided for your sins. It was made almost 2,000 years ago at Calvary. Remember, it's nothing that we can do or did, but God did it all. Just as God provided the ram sacrifice for Abraham, so God, too, provided the lamb for you. And John publicly confessed who that lamb was. It's Jesus. It's time for us to do the same. Amen? Let's pray. Father, again, Lord, we thank you for your goodness, your graciousness, and your gospel, Lord. We thank you that the gospel is heralded throughout the land, Lord. Not just in America, but all over the world. You're the God of the world, Lord. And so we pray that people would hear the message and come to you. Come to you for forgiveness. Come to you for salvation. And come to you for eternal and everlasting life. Help us all, Lord, to recognize who the Lamb of God is and always confess Him all the days of our lives. And Lord, if there's anybody out here in the audience, anywhere, that doesn't know you, we pray, Lord, you send your Holy Spirit upon them and convict them, Lord, that they do need you and they do need to have everlasting life with you. In Jesus' name, amen.